Good morning and welcome. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to open up the pages of Scripture, for we know that the voice that we hear is your voice. So, Father, as we study your word this morning, bless us. Bless us and guide us, strengthen us through your word, for indeed your word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we come to the fifth and the last session in this class that I've entitled Eyes on God. And just to review where we were last week, we talked about the subject of God, the one who responds. We talked about, as we look at the people that followed the Lord Jesus Christ recorded in Holy Scripture, we saw how incredibly human they were. We saw in which times they didn't understand, times in which they were filled with fear, times in which they were troubled or filled with despair, how absolutely human they were. But we also saw how God responded, how God responded with his word, how God responded with his word to calm the fears, to deal with their troubled spirits, to deal with the situations that they were going through. He did it then, and he certainly does it now. Well, in this last session today, I'd like to take a look with you at the topic, God, the one who replaces fear with faith. God, the one who replaces fear with faith. In in order to understand how faith replaces fear, we have to understand who we are and what God has done. So in order for us to understand how faith replaces the fear, we have to understand who we are and what God has done. So let's start this morning in Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter. Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter, and we'll pick up in verse 20. Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 20. We read, Surely there is no one on earth so righteous as to do good without ever sinning. Surely there's no one on earth so righteous as to do good without ever sinning sinning. Let's go to Romans, the third chapter. Romans in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. And the Apostle Paul, writing of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this, For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Remember that word justified is to be made just as if you never sinned. No human being will be made just as if they never sinned in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. In other words, there's no amount of good things that we can ever do that makes ourselves righteous before God. No human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1. A good way to find 1 John is to go to the last book of Holy Scripture, the book of Revelation, and then turn left, and you'll very quickly run into it. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 30 says this, But all shall die for their own sins. Ezekiel chapter 18 says this, it is only the person who sins 
that shall die. You see this continual drumbeat in Holy Scripture, this continual revelation of the fact that all of us are sinners. It, it's the confession of the Lutheran Church as we, as we confess our sins. We are in bondage to sin and we can't free ourselves. We've sinned against you in thought and word and deed by what we've done and by what we left undone. The encompassing nature of that. Scripture continually reminds us and points out to us the height and the depth and the breadth of our sin, of our rebellion against God. Before the fall into sin, our first parents, Adam and Eve, they lived in this perfect fellowship with God and with one another. But when they fell into sin, when they fell into sin, that opened up this great gulf between the perfect, holy, righteous God and humankind that was now the sinner. Between the holy and the unholy. The law reveals our sinfulness. In fact, a, a good way to understand what the law of God does, it's SOS. It shows our sin. It shows our sin. The Bible continually puts on display and reveals our sinfulness so that we know that we are unable to redeem ourselves. We are unable to save ourselves. But the word of the law, the word of the law is not the final word. For we hear of God's perfect love toward us sinners. Let's go back, please, to 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. So back to the book of Revelation. Then turn left. You bump into 1 John chapter 4. We'll pick up this time in verse 9. We read this. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That word Atonement, atoning, means to be made at one Remember that gulf that had come about because of the reality of sin, that separation between God and us, between the holy and the unholy. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he took all of our sin upon him. The punishment that should have fallen upon us fell on Jesus, the spotless lamb of God. And that relationship severed by sin was then reconciled. The atonement, the at one meant. That grace and that love of God, that perfect love. Let's go to Romans, the fifth chapter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. Romans chapter 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a, a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. The perfect love of God. I think of the Gospel of John, the third chapter. We read there, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but in order that the world might be saved through him. Romans, the eighth chapter. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me read that again. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I think of the beautiful hymn, Amazing Grace, written by John Newton. Newton was a a seaman, and he tells us that uh, as he lived his life, quote, he said of himself, he was exceedingly vile indeed. He goes on to write in his autobiography, he said, I not only sinned with a high hand myself, but made it my study to tempt and seduce others upon every occasion. And yet this slave trader had his heart changed by the grace of God. God using the word and transforming his heart into one who repents of his sin and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Newton writes this, let me not fail to praise that grace which could pardon, that blood which could expiate such sins as mine. I who was the willing slave of every evil possessed with a legion of unclean spirits have been spared and saved and changed to stand as a monument of his almighty power forever. Don't you just love how he ends that? Change to stand as a monument of his almighty power forever. And this one, who by his own admission, had lived and embraced this life of sin, knew that his heart had been changed. He was a new person through the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes that great hymn, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That's the perfect love and grace of God. Let's go, please, to Romans, the sixth chapter. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. In our baptism, we are united with what has been accomplished to the cross and the empty tomb. We are washed in the promises of God Almighty. That's the gospel. What God has done for us through the cross and the empty tomb, that Jesus died for us, that he rose for us, that we are claimed in the waters of baptism, that we are forgiven and given life eternal, that is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to summarize the gospel, you can use SOS again. The law shows our sin. The gospel shows our Savior. The law shows our sin. The gospel shows our Savior. In order to understand how faith replaces fear, We have to understand who we are and what God 
has done. We see in Holy Scripture God driving out things. Driving out things. For example, let's go to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus, the 10th chapter, please. Genesis and then Exodus. Exodus chapter 10, verse 19. Exodus 10, verse 19. We read this. The Lord changed the wind into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. So here God drives away the locusts. Let's take a look at Matthew, the 8th chapter. New Testament, very first book. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. The scripture says, That evening they brought to him many who were possessed with demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and cured all who were sick. He drove them out. He cast out. The evil spirits. Or, let's go to Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold dove. We see examples in Holy Scripture of God driving out things. God also drives out fear. And he replaces it with faith. Even as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, fear can be a a continual struggle, right? We know we've been claimed by the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that he holds us in the preciousness of his hand. He's opened up for us in all all of eternity. And he is sovereign over all of our days. We are a people of faith. And yet, at the same time, we also can struggle with fear. But God comes to drive out that fear and replace it with that trust in him and who he is. Let's go back, please, to 1 John, the fourth chapter. 1 John, chapter 4. We'll pick up in verse 15. 1 John, chapter 4. We'll pick up in verse 15. The scripture says, God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. What's that little phrase there? As he is, so are we. Remember, Scripture tells us that the Father was pleased with the Son, and the Father is also pleased with us. Why? Because of something we've done? Because of our good works? Absolutely not. He is pleased with us because claimed in the waters of baptism, we are wrapped in the perfect righteous garment of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that when God looks at us, he sees the perfect, perfect garment 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that gives us confidence to stand on Judgment Day. Verse 18. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. There is no fear in love. There is no fear because of the love of Christ for us. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ took the punishment for sin. There, there, there's no more punishment that's left for us to take. No, the Lord Jesus Christ paid it all. He paid our sin debt. The punishment fell upon him. And so the fear of punishment for the believer, it has been driven away. It's been driven away. And faith replaces fear. God comes declaring forgiveness to us. Look with me, please, at Colossians chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans. First and Second Corinthians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. And then Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And when you were dead in trespasses... And the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive together with him. When he forgave us all our trespasses. Erasing the record that stood against us. With its legal demands. He set this aside. Nailing it to the cross. God comes declaring forgiveness to us. He comes speaking Speaking to us his word. Let's go to Romans chapter 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. So that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. When we turn to the word of God, the voice we hear is God's voice. We want to hear the voice of God, we hear it right here. And God continually comes with that glorious word of forgiveness to us as he speaks to us through his word. God reminds us that he's absolutely in control. Philippians, the fourth chapter says this, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, as we trust by the grace of God in his word, all those things that scare us, they lose their threat. As we trust in God, as he comes to us through his word, all those things that scare us, they lose their threat. His love, it, it pushes out the fear. He, he pushes out that fear with his word. He pushes it out with his word of forgiveness, with the word of his presence, with the word of his comfort, with the word of his omnipotence, with the word of his sovereignty, with the word of his omniscience. On and on it goes. He comes with that incredible love, pushing out the fear, and by his grace, replacing it with faith. All of us, all of us, we need to hear that word. What a wonderful ministry it is when one person shares with another person 
the very promises of God. When one says, let me turn to Scripture, let me share with you what God has to say to you. We talked about that last week in the sermon. That indeed, we have been consoled with the promises of God so that we can be a people that console others. And so when one is troubled by their sin, when one wonders if God could ever love them, we come with that amazing, consoling word of the forgiveness of sins. When one wonders, where is God? We come with that wonderful, consoling word that God is always with us. When one wonders if God has the power to deal with a situation or a problem, we come with that wonderful, consoling word that indeed God is all powerful. It is an amazing privilege that God has given to us to be a people that share the very word that he has placed in our hands. And as we do that, God takes his word and he pushes out the fear where what remains is his promise. What remains is faith born of God. Well, in our first week together, we talked about the subject, God the Lord. We saw he, he never changes. He's faithful to his promises. And he freely gives mercy to all. In the second session, we talked about God amidst the storm. We dealt with the question of why. And when it comes to some things, we don't have the answer why. But we know the who. The one who is in charge. And we know what God can bring out of even the worst of situations. We studied about in those times, those bad things that happen in life. And, and we don't have that answer of why from God's word that we're dealing with the hidden God, as Luther said. And what Luther said, when you're dealing with the hidden God, run to the revealed God. Run to his promises of what he has revealed in Holy Scripture. In the third week, we took a look at God, the one who hears our cries. We talked about how fear can come from without and within and all around but God does not turn a deaf ear to our cry. God hears every single cry. Last week we talked about God the one who responds to our fear, to our being troubled, to our despair. He comes with the words of reassurance. And today we have studied God the one who replaces fear with faith. I pray that this class has been a blessing to you and that by his grace each and every day we may walk with our eyes on God. The Lord be with you.